Um, so uh, I am a farmer. I'm actually not a dairy farmer, uh, not yet. Someday maybe some beef cows. But my spouse and I uh, raise about 30 acres of organic vegetables. We raise about 1,000 chickens. We raise, I don't even know exactly how many pigs right now, but 25 to 30 pigs and piglets and so forth. Um, we have some Angora rabbits because my wife is a spinner. Um, we have a cat. I have a child. There's some mice and rats around the farm. It's reality. Uh, so there's all kinds of creatures around. Um, and I, I uh, have to admit that being a farmer and having it be as wet as it is, you'd think I'd have a lot of time. But actually managing 10 people, trying to keep them all busy when it's this wet and not always able to be in the field, uh, has my head spinning in a lot of circles. So I'll do my best to keep a flow through this, but I tend to be sort of scattered. Um, so I just want to tell you a couple things about that chicken uh, that Tamara just talked about. Um, our organic chickens are expensive. They're five fifty a pound, and uh, they make a lot of people go, whoa. And then we point out you can make soup afterwards, and you can do lots of things with them. But I also want to tell you some of the reasons they're expensive. Um, we feed our chickens, which are pastured, grain. One thing that a lot of consumers don't know, and I'm going to get to the role of consumers later, but consumers, uh, you need to know that a lot of pastured animals still eat a lot of grain. And if we're talking about how much food we make in this country, uh, and how we're importing food, we're going to feed a lot of our food to animals that then we eat the animals. So if we want to feed the world and we want to do it sustainably, we could shift a little bit of what we eat. And I'm a meat eater, and I'm going to say that I eat pig, and I eat chicken, and I eat cow. These are actually what we eat. I sort of beef and poultry and pork. We actually eat animals if you're a meat eater, so be aware of that. Um, and um, and I, and I grew up, uh, I was the fourth child in my family, and so I'm going to get to the, the term moderation in a minute here. But um, my parents, by the time I was in a teenager, sort of had given up on the hope of controlling their children and what they were going to do when they were in high school. And they basically just said to me, look, we know you're going to drink. We know you're probably going to smoke marijuana. Would you just do it in moderation? Be safe. Don't drive. Well, we can all eat meat. I eat meat. We don't have to eat meat three times a day. So if we want a sustainable food system, we want a system that can feed the world, we have enough land, we have the ability to grow enough food, it doesn't all have to be turned into meat and ethanol. So that's one arena. Um, so just do it in moderation. Um, but one of the expensive, expensive things about our chicken uh, is, is the organic grain. So pastured meat does eat grain. So if you're thinking about pesticides and herbicides and water, which has been talked about today, if you're eating a conventional pastured chicken or conventional pastured pork, you're still eating part of a food system that is contributing to pesticide and herbicide use somewhere. So think about that. As consumers, you have to know these things because the terms pastured and ethically raised and natural all are really nice words but they have no federal definition of any kind, and a lot of them are used as marketing terms, and many of them are better circumstances. And as you're choosing your food, you have to think about what is your ethic? What is your litmus test? Is it the health of the food you're putting into your body for your own personal health reasons? Is it the health of how the food was raised for the workers who are working to grow the food or raise the food? Is it the health of the way the food was raised to think about the water quality and the land and the health of the soil where that food was raised, you have to come to your own conclusion on what litmus test you want to choose. Because as was raised earlier by Secretary Ross, local food versus organic food from Mexico is not always an easy decision. Uh, however, if you're going to buy local food and pay a premium and it's the same price as local organic food, why not buy the organic stuff? That's my little plug. Um, uh, but in terms of that chicken, this morning, as uh, we have the next three to seven inches of rain forecast for the next five days, um, I was thinking about our chickens that are in the field. And we raise ours to sort of by the Joel Salatin model. Some of you may have heard of them. They're these mobile pens you move every day, uh, sometimes twice a day, once the chickens are getting bigger. It is wet out there. Even on sloped, sandy soil, it is so wet out there that my chickens are wet 24 hours a day, even though there's shelter on top of them and shelter to the north and west on the pens. And so this morning I said to Angus, 
We've got to make some platforms to put in the bottom of those uh, pens, just for a quarter of them, even though they're supposed to be on ground, we've got to let them get up off the ground. We just have to, especially if we're going to get this much more rain. Certainly, I have an economic interest. I don't want them to die. But it just doesn't feel right to have them in that circumstance. Well, that's going to take Angus six hours today. We had to go buy some wood from Clifford Lumber, which is right around the corner, supporting the local economy. And um, he was drilling, screwing screws together real quick to make these little platforms to insert in the bottom, and he slipped and he just drilled right through his finger. And so he wrapped up his finger and he kept working. Okay. Um, so that's what farmers sometimes do. If you have to get it done because it's going to start raining at 2 o'clock, you're not going to go to the hospital to deal with your finger. You're going to get those platforms made for those chickens. Farming isn't for everyone. And fortunately, we don't always drill holes in our fingers. But I can pretty much show you scabs on my fingers any day of the week you want. Um, so farming isn't always ideal. It's been a bit wet. And uh, you may know that. It just means the weeds keep coming. So we keep weeding. And we weed in the rain, and we work in the rain. But I'll tell you positive things in a minute. Don't worry. Um, I'm going to jump to farming and economics and different players in the farming system. You've got government, you've got education, you've got nonprofits, you've got farms and farmers, and you've got consumers. I'm going to super fast go through all five of those. Um, I see government and our education system and our nonprofits as catalysts for a sustainable food system. But farms and farmers and consumers are the end. The role for government and the role for nonprofits and the role for education is to help people get over the hurdles that the straight capitalist system is failing with respect to profitability for farms and farmers. What do I mean by that? Well, in Vermont, we've got a handful of different policies that we've put together over 30 years that have helped make Vermont one of the epicenters of an economic food system that's starting to work. From land use conservation issues and current use, which is a state program to make land that's farmed and forested affordable for the farmers and the foresters by reducing their taxes, to a program called Food Education Every Day, which addressed some of the issues talked about earlier with kids in schools. Now, this program started with people out and about doing amazing things, coming into schools making uh, butternut, is he still here? Um, butternut muffins instead of sugary chocolate muffins for kids to eat, and the kids liked it. And what they did is they went into schools and they made different kinds of cookies, oatmeal instead of an oatmeal raisin instead of chocolate chip. Still got a lot of sugar, but they kept cutting things in, maple sugar instead of you know, processed sugar. Um, and so Food Education Every Day is a program that's now, with some state financial support to this nonprofit Food Education Every Day, working in schools throughout Vermont, getting kids into eating healthier food in their schools. And now there's junior iron chef competitions, because kids are interested in making food out of raw ingredients and turning that chicken and egg into more than just a slab of chicken and a hard boiled egg. So as that happens, those kids are going to start being interested in real food. Well, when they're interested in real food, who are they talking to the most? Their parents. So their parents are having to go out and get real ingredients. Well, where are they going to get those? Well, they're going to get them from the farms and the farmer's markets and so forth. So these catalyst events help the profitability for the farms and farmers in the long run. The university, I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, with the farm program here and the farms educational program, we have people paying to learn how to farm. And I've had a few of them come to me at the farmer's market and I've said, wow, have you ever farmed? Well, no, not yet. Why don't you go farm for a couple years, work for a farm, and then go to a university where you, as you're learning what you're learning, you'll have some practical connection to that reality. And frankly, why don't you come to my farm and pay me the $10,000 to learn from me what it's like when you got to do these things. But, but there could be more connection and more synergy, and I think the kids would get more out of it, and certainly would help the farmers, where our our hybrid of trying to create 
healthy, organic food, at least our farm's philosophy, but trying to make it more affordable is one of the most difficult pair of lines to make cross. Because our costs of production are what they are. I guarantee you on those $5.50 a pound chicken, I am not making as much money as the Koch brothers. In fact, I'm not making as much money as most professors at UVM, and not as much money as teachers, but I'm making a living. But I can only afford to pay my workers between $9.50 and $15 an hour. And I would love to pay them more. They deserve more. They were working out in the rain at 6 o'clock yesterday morning. Today, at least, it wasn't raining at 6 in the morning. But it's, it's work. It's also fun. I'm going too slowly for the things I need to say. Um, nonprofits play a similar role. Um, nonprofits, I started farming in the intervale set at the intervale, where land was available and equipment was available without capital. So I could learn to farm, learn to sell my product, and then eventually go out and buy land and take on that $100,000 of debt. It's a great catalyst. It allowed me to develop those things and then go off and do it on my own. But it doesn't mean the intervale should be selling food, which they're now doing, and I'll stop there. But they took a million dollars to create CSA competition for the 30 farms that are selling CSA shares in Chittenden County. In the long run, that's not helping the farms they're buying from, because if all the grant money disappears, those farms' system will fall apart. So you can't rely on grant money to create a food system. It started with great intentions, and they do a lot of good. But there's roles to play, and you have to be aware of mission creep in the nonprofit world. So ultimately, it's between farms and consumers that's going to be the engine that's going to drive it. It's going to be the decisions you make with your dollars. So you're going to go buy more widgets and funky things and nicer new belts and a newer iPhone every time it comes out, or you're going to spend a little bit more money on your food at the local market. And when you buy at the local market, that allows people like me to look at my customers and look at them when they come to me. We have another, another government program, by the way, which is called um, Farm to Family Coupons instead of food stamps. And they can bring them in $3 increments and buy vegetables with their food stamps. Well, when someone grabs a, punch, a bunch of beans and brings it up to me, and it weighs out to be $3.50, and they're taking out their coupon booklet, how much do you think I tell them that bag of beans cost? So if I'm more profitable in general, I can afford to charge $3 for that bag of beans or even say, here, there's a cucumber right here. Take that too. So we, now, in some regards, that's a handout, certainly. But that person's making the effort to feed that healthy food to their family and their children. And as they eat better and go to schools with Farm to Education Every Day programs, and those kids are learning more about healthy food, and then those kids are able to sit in their seats in the classroom instead of fidgeting all the time, not because they need Ritalin, but because they're getting a, a diet of sugar. They'll learn better. And so that's how these systems all come together. And it's from the decisions that you make with your food dollars versus your new widgets that you buy, and moving your discretionary dollar from what it's become, which is only 5% or so of your money goes towards food, from the 30% that it once was back in the 50s, et cetera. And we don't have to go all the way back to 30%, but just move 1% or 2% back into healthy, sustainable food, and the system will develop itself. So as consumers, educate others and use your dollars wisely if that's the system you want to be a part of. Just want to finish by saying I, I wake up a lot of times at 4 o'clock, 4.30, Sometimes on farmer's market day, it's a little bit before 4. Um, the rain and the weeds can be really difficult. Drilling your finger isn't so much fun. That didn't happen to me, but I did bang my elbow today. Um, but I also, the other day, was cultivating and saw moose tracks through my potato field. And last year, I saw some bear pins. And, and I stopped everything, turned off the tractor, yelled to the crew in the different parts, come over, take a look. The things you get from being outside and seeing the changes every day is so invaluable. And the things I get from families, particularly pregnant women that come buy my food, the energy I get from people that say, I don't know how you do it. You have the best tasting food I've ever tasted. 
on that one, I say, well, that's because you've been buying industrial food for the last 20 years. You've, they've made it really easy for me. But when people make those comments or ask me, how's it going with all this rain? That, that community is what keeps me going. And so communication and community and spirit and song, that's, that's where it all comes together. So you don't all have to be farmers, but you'll see fewer moose prints, bear prints. Blue heron flew by the other day. The sunrises are beautiful. And uh, that's what gives me the energy to go to Montpelier for months of the year and do work. Thank you.